Blake. <laughs> amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, um, yes. <clears throat> okay. Just so that we are very clear, um, <clears throat> you know that we are live streaming this, and my wife is watching, and she said to make sure you know that she did not start the argument that we had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was me. I'm sure I was, and I'm sure I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> but God turned it to good. Okay. So <clears throat> now it's like having the Holy Spirit there to remind you. you know, so <clears throat> so <clears throat> excuse me. Now we've been talking about healing. Uh, why did Jesus heal? Because this is important that you get it. You've got to have this, these things solid in you. And, and I, I know I'm, I'm kind of rotating through these things. You've got to have the authority. You've got to understand what it means to walk in authority. To walk in authority, and, and you really, <clears throat> you only see the people praying one time for boldness. And even in that, see, the righteous are as bold as a lion. So you shouldn't have to pray for boldness. Boldness should be a part of who you are, right? And that boldness doesn't mean brash. It doesn't mean rude. <clears throat> it simply means <clears throat> having the freedom to speak, speaking freely, boldly, boldly speaking, all right? <clears throat> you should be as bold about the things of God as you are about your own name. Somebody asks you your name, you ought to be able to just put that out there because you would because you know it's your name. You're bold about it. It's the same thing with the Word of God. <clears throat> but you have to know it, and you have to decide that it's true. That's really what all this comes down to. It's you deciding. So, see, see, Here's the thing. I'm not trying to build faith in you so you can get healed, right? Whether you have faith or not, you can get healed, right? That, that doesn't matter. Now, we want you to have faith, but the reason I want you to have faith in God's Word is so that you can go out and be the miracle for somebody else. Not so you can get it. So you, I'm not trying to build faith in you so you can get it for you. <clears throat> I mean, think about this. I didn't, I didn't study for 40 years just to give it to you so it could die with you. Amen. <clears throat> what we share, we intend for you to share. What you hear, what goes in your ear should come out your mouth. Amen? Amen? And so <clears throat> we share these things because we want you to get it. And I want you to have faith in God because I want you to know you can trust him. He is faithful. You can trust him. Even whenever we're not, he is. Yes. Amen? Yes. And so he loves people and he wants to help people. All I'm trying to do is get the, the excuses and things that we have in the way get them out of the way so that he can use you to help other people because he wants to use you because we're all he's got you know he doesn't everybody thinks well this person or you know god can't use me until i'm perfect well i, I prove that ain't true right <clears throat> but the point is uh, we can't wait till we're perfect to get started you know it's like people say well, i'm looking for a perfect church well even if you find one if you join it it won't be <clears throat> so you know just keep on going okay <laughs> So, we have to realize, now, healing like Jesus. Now, see, here's one of the problems. We have a whole lot of ways, a whole lot of different camps, different schools, different ideas, <clears throat> different healing teachings. We got all that stuff. But the key is, we're supposed to be looking like Jesus. You get that? We're going to grow up into him in all things. So, our job, when they, the, about Jesus himself said, when a disciple is fully trained, he will be as his master. So here's the, the, one of the determining things for me, and this is one of the reasons <clears throat> why there are people I don't listen to anymore. <clears throat> Whenever you listen to someone, <clears throat> if you do what they say, you should look more like Jesus than you did when you started. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you do what they tell you to do, you should look more like Jesus, not less like him. Okay, so if you go, I'm just going to be blunt and, you know, I'm not, I say name names. I'm not talking about people. I'm not against people, but I am against wrong doctrine. I am against error, right? But if you go and you listen to or you go through a, a theophostics class, when you get done, you will look less like Jesus than when you started because Jesus never did that. So you're adding stuff that Jesus didn't do. If you go through sozo and you teach sozo to people, Jesus never did that. Do you get that? I'm, I'm not, I'm, understand, I'm not against anybody. 
but we have to look more like Jesus. So we don't need these other things. You will notice most of the manual you're looking at is Scripture. There's just a couple of things there. There's really no chapters written that is just teaching. It's all Scripture. Why? Because I don't want you to memorize. I don't want you to be indoctrinated. I want you to read Scripture, see what it says, and be able to say what it says. And we all know this is our, a DHD manual, but this is our primary manual. Amen? Amen? So we have to go back to this. The devil doesn't care if you say, uh, devil, it is written in the Theophosics manual. He would love for you to say that. Why? Because he doesn't have to abide by anything. But when you say it's written and it's in the Word of God, that's different. Do you get that? We've got to strip away Everything that doesn't matter, everything that's not accurate, everything that's not right, everything that makes us not look like Jesus, we've got to strip that away until it's just him and not us. Amen? Amen. So in the, on section 5 here, page 45, healing was a sign, not a reward. Now, I'm not going to read all this because we've already mentioned actually most of these. <clears throat> Mark 16, verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, I am going to mention this part. Watch this. And these signs <clears throat> shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Isn't that right? Now, go with me. Actually, if you can put up uh, 18, 19, 20, verse 20. It'll be faster than if I, well, it may be faster. <laughs> Mark 16, 20. We're getting there. Okay. There we go. Now look at this. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So be it. In other words, this should continue. You get that? So be it. Not the end. Now, notice here. If you look in the King James or you look in the original Greek either, both of them, it says, and they went forth, and, and this is the way the King James says it, <clears throat> and you'll notice if you have a King James, if you're looking at it, it'll say, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with, and the word them is in italics, which means it's not in the original Greek, right? So what the scripture actually says in the Greek is this, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming the word. You see that? God was not confirming people. He confirms his word. <clears throat> he, <clears throat> he was working with <clears throat> and confirming the word with signs following. Now, <clears throat> let's take this piece by piece. If you're going to go forth, I, I, years ago I was driving down the road in Dallas and God spoke I, and he kept bringing this, confirming the word, confirming the word, confirming the word. And when he repeats something over and over again, I know he's trying to get something across to me. And uh, so I'm like, okay, confirming the word. What? He said, because I've, I've been praying, God, we need more miracles. We need to see it in the church. The body of Christ needs to see dramatic miracles. It, it needs to make an impression on people to the point where it, it, they take notice. And not just in the church, but outside the church. <clears throat> and so he kept bringing this. And he said, confirming the word. And I said, okay, I, I know the scripture. Mark 16, I know that. Confirming the word. He said, <clears throat> if you, he said, if you want more signs and wonders, preach more of my word. Less of yours. Why? Because he can't confirm my words. He confirms his word. And if I preach his word, he'll confirm it with signs following. So if you don't have signs following, it's, because, it's not because God isn't confirming you because he doesn't confirm people. He's not confirming his word. You want more signs, preach more word. Real simple. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, notice here too. Um, <clears throat> let's look at this. We know that the Holy Spirit... I know this is a touchy subject, okay? We generally, if somebody said, well, we're just going to follow the Holy Ghost. We're just going to follow the Spirit. That's what we're going to do. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I agree to a degree. But the Bible doesn't necessarily say that, okay? And this is one of the things that stood out when I was reading some of the stuff that John Lake said. He said, one of the main things you'll see us in the letter, we'll probably get to read it tomorrow. But he said one of the main things that emphasized the truth of dominion to him was the fact that God gave us the Holy Spirit 
so that we could do his works. He, now, get this. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Spirit to us. Do you get that? He did not give you to the Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Spirit to us. Do you get that? Yeah. Now, what that means is this. See, people say, well, we're going to follow the Spirit. We're going to follow the Spirit. We're going to follow the Holy Ghost. Okay. I, I agree with the idea that we are going to go in the path of God. Because that's generally what it means. But the Bible doesn't say that we are going to follow him. What it actually says, because people get that from the idea where, they, where it says uh, that he leads and guides. But it doesn't say that he leads and guides you every second to do everything. It definitely never says he leads anybody to lay hands on the sick or to heal the sick. It never says that. It says that the Holy Spirit's job, when he comes, he will be our teacher who will lead and guide us into all truth. Now get that. He didn't say he will lead you into action. He will lead you into truth. When you receive truth, truth should cause you to act. When you learn truth, you have to obey and become obedient to truth. Do you get that? So when he says that believers will lay hands on the sick, then he tells you, you're a believer, you're supposed to lay hands on the sick. You have to decide to obey. You don't follow the Holy Spirit. You don't say, well, I'm waiting for him to lead me. Okay? You have a command. A command does not need a leading. Do you get that? If, if it's not a command, then it's a suggestion. Well, we, God, Jesus didn't give us suggestions. He gave us commands. Believers shall lay hands on the sick. So we have to become obedient and do what he said. Right? He doesn't have to lead us to obey a command. Amen? If you're in the military or in any other authoritarian type situation and your commanding officer said, do this, then imagine if you were a good Christian standing there, and he says, I, I just told you to do this. What are you waiting on? Well, sir, you know I'm a Christian. Well, yeah, so what? Well, I, I, I'm, I have to be led by the Spirit. So I'm waiting for the Spirit to lead me to obey you. Now, how do you think that would go over? Not too good. I actually probably say, I, here, I got a leading for you. I'm going to let these two soldiers, these two MPs, lead you to the stockade. How's that? And we'll lock you up until you become obedient. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know that's a drastic case, but I want you to understand it. You don't need a, a, you don't need a leading to obey a command. If it's a command, the command has within itself its own leading to be obeyed. Does that make sense? If it doesn't have that, it's not a command. It's just simply a suggestion. So we have to realize, now, notice this. He gave us the Holy Spirit, right? So if he gave us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to us. And as we, it, it says right there, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming the word with signs following. Now, the signs following were what? He said, these signs shall follow those who believe, right? Now, picture this. These signs shall follow them which believe, right? So you got the believer, then the believer does something. And then, because now notice, what are the signs? One of the signs are believers are going to lay hands and the sick are going to recover. Is that right? So the sick recovering is the sign along with the laying on of hands of the believer. But before the sick can recover, the believer has to do something. Is that right? So first, the believer has to lay hands. Then the sick can recover. When the sick recover, that's after the believer lays hands. Right? I know I'm being redundant. Okay? That's on purpose. And then, now notice, once that happens, that's a sign to people that God was there. Isn't that right? And the healing is the sign that follows the believer. So if the, now understand, is there anybody in this room that in and of yourself, you can heal the sick? All by yourself, totally excluding Jesus. No. Okay, so when you lay hands on the sick, who actually heals? Jesus, by the Spirit, right? Okay. Now, notice, so if you lay hands, now notice, the Holy Spirit can't do His job until you do your job. Is that right? Mark 16, right? So if the sign is healing, and the sign follows the believer, and the person that does the sign is the Holy Spirit, then who's following who? The Holy Spirit's following you. Do you, do you get that? If the signs are following you and the Holy Spirit does the sign, 
then he had to wait till you did something, so you have to move before he can move. Well, we're just waiting on God to move. No, God's waiting on you to move. Why? Because you have to move before he can move. Do you get that? Do, do you see? So once you realize that. Now, I'm not saying that God is, well, I could say it, and it'd still be right. But what we have to realize is that for the most part, God is held captive and is not able to do what he wants to do until his body does what he said to do so that he can follow. Do you understand that? So while we follow him, now I'll give you the example. Um, years ago, uh, South Bend, Indiana, they had the car dealership there. Not the dealership, the uh, they, were, they had a car factory. They had the Studebaker that was produced there. They had the Avante that was produced there. And so you could go through the um, factory, and <clears throat> they had this thing that you go up into the stairway, and the factory is a big open thing. It looked like an airplane hangar. It was huge. had cars, had the chassis of the car, and all that kind of stuff. And we get there, <clears throat> and you had to go up this rail. It was really hot in there at that time. It was in the summer. And at that time, I was working... Um, actually, I just moved up there. My wife and my kids were still in Dallas, and so I had moved up. I got a job detasseling corn in the summer, which is a horrible job, okay? But I was detasseling corn, and then they gave us these free tickets. The, the family I was staying with at the time gave me free tickets to go through this tour of the Studebaker factory. And so it's me and a couple other people from the, from the church there. We went through this thing. So we go to the stairway, and you had to go up the stairway to this little room, and in the room, you can't see what's in there, but there's windows there. And you go up, and it's hot in the factory. And all these workers are down there on the factory, and they're all sweating, and it's hot. And we go up this thing. We open this door, and the air conditioning is full blast. I mean, it's nice, right? And we walk in. There's this guy sitting. It looked like a lazy boy recliner. I mean, he's sitting in there, and he's kicked back. He ain't sweating at all. And he's got all these joysticks in front of him. And he's just sitting back and drinking some iced tea and just, just moving these, these joysticks around. And we started, we kind of gathered around, and so we get around them, and they got these cranes out in the factory. <clears throat> and these cranes are moving across, and, it, and we started noticing, every time he, he would just touch the thing. I mean, it wasn't like he was really working it, he, has, he had it down. He was just barely touching this thing, and that crane would go across, go down, pick up a car, and then put it over on the chassis. It was amazing. And he's sitting there drinking tea and moving cars around. And all these guys down on the floor, they're all working hard and sweating, and he wasn't. So we're standing there, and while I'm standing there, it's like the Holy Spirit said, actually, I believe it was the Father, maybe Jesus, but he said, that's what the Spirit is. And I said, what? You know, automatically, I said, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, that right there. <clears throat> and I said, what, what do you mean? And he, was, he said, the company wanted these cars built. So they hired this man to get the job done. But the man can't move a car. So they had to provide the equipment between the car and the man's hand that could get the job done. Now, what it did was it took the will of the company, and they were all healed. Now, so what we see over and over again, the, the common thing is that they were all healed. You get that? And yet, it's amazing. You start talking to people about healing, and the first thing they want to bring up is the wrong interpretation Actually, not even interpretation. It is completely misspoken, uh, mistranslated, not mistranslated, but um, misquoted. Put it that way. And they always bring this up, and you start talking about healing, and they'll say, well, yeah, but, you know, I don't know how we could expect to get everybody healed when even Jesus couldn't get everybody healed in his hometown. All right? So let's actually read what it says about that. All right? He says here in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 53, and now, I'm going to give you two accounts of the exact same situation. Each account gives you a little bit different picture, but together you get the whole picture. We have, and so, Matthew 13, verse 53. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simone and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. 
But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now notice, it does not say he did not do any. It said he didn't do many. You get that? So he didn't do a whole lot of things because of their unbelief. Now, we don't know what he didn't do, but we do know this. Now watch this. <clears throat> because in, verse, in Mark chapter 6, verse 1, he went out from thence, came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many hearing him were starting to say, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? So you can see it's the exact same situation told by Mark. Verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Same situation, same exact story, just told by a different person. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, among his own kin, in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save, that means except. So, see, people say, well, see, he could do no mighty work. No, 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 it doesn't say he could do no mighty work. It says he could do no mighty work except he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. So the very scripture, this is the one that most people try to use and say, Jesus couldn't get everybody healed in his own hometown, right? And some of them even say, well, because of unbelief, Jesus couldn't get anybody healed. Well, that's not true because he said he could not do no mighty work there except he did lay his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Now, notice this. First off, we notice that they were offended at him. Now, it does not say that he, that he laid his hands on some people and tried and failed because of their unbelief. It does not say that. It says he could not do any mighty, many mighty works. There are no mighty works in one place except that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. So what we do know is this. Even with all the unbelief, people got healed. And this is the verse they tried to use to prove that Jesus can't heal amongst unbelief. But here it says, even with the unbelief, people still got healed. Is that right? Amen. Now, the other thing is this. He laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. What does that mean? That means that every person he laid hands on got healed. Now, I don't care if you lay hands on 3,000 or 300. If you, or, three, or three. Let's say three. That'd be a few, right? But if I laid hands on three people, in other words, if all of you got mad at me, and then we had a healing service, and most of you wouldn't even come back in here, but three people showed up, and they came down front, and I laid hands on three people, and they all got healed. How many of you know that's 100%? Is that right? Yes. And now, is it my fault that you got mad and didn't come back in? No, you're not going to blame me with not being able to do that. Isn't that right? You just say, well, they got offended, and they didn't come back. But the whole point is, everybody that did, everybody that he laid hands on got healed. Do you see that? There's not one person ever that he tried and failed to heal. Not one. So we have to take, take that whole thing out of, well, he tried, but he couldn't do it. I've heard people talk about that and you know, try to paint a picture of that. And they go right around these scriptures, but they try to say, well, see, because of the unbelief. And they try to make excuse for why they can't get people healed because they'll say it's because of people's unbelief. Or they'll say, well, it must not be God's will. No, the fact is, whoever came to him got healed. Well, now, why was it only a few? Because we just read. They all got offended. They were offended. If people get mad at you, they generally don't come to your meetings. And they definitely don't come and let you lay hands on them. Matter of fact, most of them want to lay hands on you. Right? So we have to realize that Jesus did not try and fail. Now, let's take this, again, this, um, <clears throat> just, just looking at, at even what we would call statistics. Right? One of the things I've noticed is that around the world, I don't care if it's 120,000 people or 12 people, usually 90% of them need healing, almost always. You ever notice James wrote the book, and he said, if there be any sick among you. Now, how many of you know, probably if you wrote to any church in America, you wouldn't have to write that. Yeah. Isn't that right? Because you would assume there's probably some sick there. Isn't that right? Yeah. But James wrote, if there be any sick among you, which gives us the idea that there shouldn't be, technically, but then he even goes on and says, but if there are, let them call for the elders and let the elders come to them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and they will pray the prayer of faith. Now notice, it's not the anointing, it's not the oil, it's not a gift. The prayer of faith shall save, heal the sick. 
And the Lord, and if he, and it says, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he has committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Notice there that the sins are forgiven after the healing takes place. Not before. But, but I thought sin stopped healing. You know, here you lay hands on the sick, and God heals them, and the sins are forgiven afterwards. You see that? Why? Because that's the exact order it was done. Jesus went to the whipping post first, paid for the healing before he paid for your sin. That's the proper order. Do you get that? Now, I'm just, just pointing these things out. <clears throat> but now notice, he says, that if there be any sick among you. So usually 90% of any congregation, any group of people need healing. So if you have 100 people, that's 90 people, right? If you have 1,000, that's 900. Well, John Lake had almost the exact same experience when he started a church in Houston in 1927. He started with 1,000 people. 800 of them were sick. So that's about 80%, not quite 90%. He told them, for 30 days, I am not going to lay hands on anybody. For 30 days, all I'm going to do every day is preach the word to you. And he only did it for about an hour each day. And so he said, for 30 days, I'm gonna, at the end of 30 days, anybody that's not healed, I will lay hands on. So he did this for 30 days, taught the word of God. At the end of 30 days, he only had to pray for 30 people. 770 people got healed listening to the word preached in truth in a 30-day period. Now, think about that, right? Now, <clears throat> again, 90% of any group. <clears throat> How many times does it say, and, and it only gives us a couple of numbers, <clears throat> but once it says, well, several times it says, great multitudes followed Jesus. Isn't that right? And it said he healed their sick. So you had a multitude, great multitudes, all these words. So I don't know what a multitude would necessarily be. I guess you can decide for yourself. <clears throat> but let's say we know for a fact that Jesus fed the multitude. Isn't that right? <clears throat> remember where it's at. <laughs> kind of <remember> it's <clears throat> but so if one time he fed 4,000, one time 5,000. So we know that's a multitude, right? So let's say, <clears throat> let's just be very generous. And let's say that a multitude is 1,000 people. So out of 1,000 people, 900 would be sick, right? And if Jesus had a great multitude and he had compassion and he healed all that were sick, that's 900 people that got healed. Mm -hmm. Now think about that, all right? Think about that in comparison to our modern theology. How could that ever happen? Because if you, now, now seriously, think of these numbers. You got 900 people, right, <clears throat> that need to be healed. Okay, let's be even more uh, conservative about it. Let's say 500 people. 500 people need healing, okay? That's still a good number. Imagine trying to get 500 people together that it just so happens that every person in the room, 500 people, they all have enough faith to get healed. That would be a miracle in itself. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. All right? Not to mention, you got 500 people that not one of them in the room <clears throat> has a generational curse that keeps them from getting healed. Not one of them out of 500 people. That, that's a miracle, you know, according to the way people think. And I'm, just, I'm just bringing up modern theology. Isn't that right? Let's say <clears throat> out of that, <clears throat> all 500, wow, they are all really lucky because it just so happens that that's the day that God wants them healed. It just, they all got there on the same day. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think, I've already told you at least three things. Now, imagine of getting all those people in the same room that have none of those things or that they all have enough faith and all these other things. Do you realize what the odds would be of getting 500 people? What that means is this. Either our theology is wrong, the theology, the common theology of the day, or Jesus was the luckiest preacher that ever lived because he was able to get everybody there. It was all God's will. It, God wasn't trying to teach anybody anything. He wanted everybody free. That was their day. They all had enough faith. No generational curses. Uh, you know, all of that together. Imagine getting all that together. The odds would be astronomical. Because every time you add another you know, condition, another qualifier, the odds go up. Yes. So that ought to tell us something right there, that all of these ideas that we have are not accurate concerning the will of God. Amen? Amen. Now, <clears throat> let's look at this. In, um, yeah, <clears throat> it said there, in verse 5, and he could there do no mighty work except he laid his hands on upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. In other words, he would have got a lot more, but he marveled at their unbelief. Now, only two times he marveled. One was at 
their unbelief, and the other was at the faith of the centurion, right? Now, again, I keep wanting to drill this in because you've got to understand. I don't care who you are. Okay, if you're a policeman, technically your name doesn't matter. All that counts is the badge and the gun. The badge is the authority. The gun is the ability. You got that? That's all that counts. Now, let's say you are a policeman. And let's say you're a rookie, right? Which means you get the not good jobs, right? If they, if they need somebody to do traffic control, guess who's going to get it? It's going to be the rookie. It's not going to be the chief or, you know, any, anybody like that. It's not going to be anybody with a higher rank. Isn't that right? Now, think about this. You've got, let's, let's say you're out here on this road, there's construction, and you've got a policeman standing there, and they are directing traffic, and they're stopping traffic, and they're letting other traffic go, and then they're stopping that traffic, and letting that traffic go, and they're directing, right? And you're a, ci a civilian, citizen. You're driving up. You see that, that uniform. You don't stop and go, what, what's his name? What's that policeman's name? No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't recognize him. I'm going to go around. You don't do that. You see the uniform. You see the badge. You see the gun. You're going to obey it because that is symbols of authority. Is that right? They have the authority and the ability to back up the authority if needed, right? So here you come pulling up, and he, that rookie, you realize nothing on his sleeves. He's a rookie, brand new, just got out of the academy. He puts his hand out. You stop, right? And then you notice a car coming up beside, and you look over, and there's a uniform in that car. And that rookie sees that car, and he goes, stop, and he looks, and he goes, oh, he does this, and he lets the car go on by. Why? Because he looks inside the car, and that uniform has stripes or has stars or bars or something on the, on the collar that shows rank, right? Now, you and I, we don't care. If, I don't care if it's a rookie or a, or a sergeant or a chief. doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter who they are. If they have the uniform, the gun, the badge, you're going to obey them because rank doesn't matter. You don't look at a rookie and go, you're a rookie. You can't do nothing to me. You know, if you want to arrest me, go, go find a sergeant or go find, you don't, you, why? Because all that counts is he's a policeman. That's all that counts. <clears throat> but now internally, it matters if the policeman has stripes, has stars on a collar, whatever it is. Why? That's all internal. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter to us, but it matters to the rookie and it matters to the, to the department, right? Okay. Now, what you have to realize is this. In God's economy, in his understanding, in his hierarchy, the believer is the big guy. All the promises are for the believer. There's not a promise for an apostle. There's not a promise for a prophet, not a promise for an evangelist, not a promise for a pastor, not a promise for a teacher. There are requirements, but not promises. The promises are for the believer. He that believes, whosoever believes, isn't that right? So the promises are for the believer. Now, the believer is technically the lowest rank. I mean, you get in the door, you're a believer. Isn't that right? And you may be called to be something else, but it really doesn't really matter. Why? Because out there in the world, nobody cares. You, you go down to Walmart, walk through there, big sign, like, apostle, so and so. They don't care. They just look at it. What is it? Who is that? You know, they don't care. See, apostle, prophet, event, that only matters in the church. It doesn't matter to the world. Right? It doesn't matter to the devil. Because the apostle also has to be a believer because the believer is the only person that has promises. See, being an apostle doesn't give you more power. It gives you more responsibility. Being a prophet doesn't give you more power. It gives you more responsibility. Do you get it? Authority has more responsibility, not more ability. See, it's your response to his ability. That's what responsibility is, right? So when you look at it this way, you start to realize that the people at Walmart, they could care less. If you call yourself a prophet, they can care less if you're an apostle. They, they don't care what you call yourself. All they want to know is, my baby's sick. Can you help my baby? That's all they care about. And a believer can help the baby. And if an apostle is going to be an apostle, he's first. He always has to be a believer also. Amen? And being an apostle, being a prophet, whatever, does not alleviate you from normal things. You still got to believe, just like everybody else has to believe. You just have the responsibility of the church on your shoulders now also, and you care about the church and where it goes, and there's a greater responsibility, not a greater power. Do you get that? Yes. Because all the, all the promises were made to the believer 
all the promises of power were to whosoever will or to he that believeth, right? Not he that's an apostle. Amen? Do you get this? So the, the devil doesn't care what you call yourself. As long as you're a believer, that's the only thing that counts. So you think, well, I hear you, Curry. You're talking about authority. You're talking about these things. But, you know, I, I mean, I just, I just go to work Monday through Friday, and, you know, and I, I come home and have the weekend and come to church on Sunday. I mean, I'm a believer, but that's, that's all I do. No, no, no. That might be all you do. I'm not even going to say if it's all you're called to do. I'm not even going to go there. What I'm saying is this. It doesn't matter if you are active duty or if you're in inactive duty. God didn't put you in inactive duty. You might have put yourself there. But it doesn't matter what you are. You're still a believer. And you can still do whatever a believer can do. Do you get that? So at any moment, you say, well, but you don't understand, Craig. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't been through Bible school. Neither did I. Right? When I went to Dr. Summerall's, I was planning on going up there to go to Bible school. I'd go up there, and instead I'd hang around him and get as close to him, and I ended up not going to Bible school, and he became my Bible school. Right? Why? Because I got around somebody that was doing, and I didn't want to go to his Bible school and be taught by a bunch of people. I didn't know who they were. I wanted to be around him. And so we volunteered to be on his prayer line, and that let us get near him. And so we were volunteering and learning. So all this thing, people have this idea of what, but you don't understand, you don't know who I am because I'm nobody. Well, that's funny you should say that because that's exactly what Gideon said when he was hiding behind the threshing field, the, the, the threshing thing, whatever. The, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And here the angel shows up and says, oh, mighty man of valor. Yeah, the guy hiding over behind the, the wheat bin, Right? He's, why was he hiding over there? Because he's afraid the Midians would come in and see what he was doing. He was hiding. And he said, oh, you got it wrong. He said, I'm the least in my family, and my family is the least in Israel. He said, oh, boy, if you got the wrong person. <clears throat> but that didn't even phase the angel of the Lord. Isn't that right? The angel of the Lord said, no, you're a mighty man of valor. Now you go and this your strength. Isn't that right? He said, you go and you do this, and you're going to take over the Midians, and you're going to do these things. And now notice... God didn't call him what he was. He called him what he saw him. Do you get that? He didn't call him as he was. He called him what he was going to be. Why? Because he knew what he was in God. He knew what God had in him. See, the problem is Gideon, just like the Israelites, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And they said, we are but grasshoppers in their sight. These people are big. They're giants. They got walled cities. This, this land devours everybody that comes in. It's going to be terrible. We can't do this. We, they said, we are grasshoppers in our own sight, and therefore we're grasshoppers in their sight. Well, it didn't say that, that they were grasshoppers in the other sight, and therefore they were grasshoppers in their own sight. It says, because we see ourselves like this, they're going to see us like this. But now notice... And that kept them out of the promised land. But we have to realize that you have to understand that the devil doesn't see you even the way you see you. God sees you one way. The devil sees you actually the way God sees you. The problem is you don't see you the way God sees you. And when you start to see you the way God sees you instead of how everybody else sees you, then you'll quit talking about being the least in the family and the least in the nation and the least in this state and the least in... And you start talking and you start saying, you know what? I don't care if I am the least in my family. Why? Because I'm in the family of God. And the least in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest prophet that ever lived. Do you realize that's what Jesus said about John the Baptist? Do you get that? He said, of all the prophets born of women, there is not a risen one greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom is greater than John. Think about that. If you're in Christ, you are better than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the greatest prophet that ever lived, according to Jesus. Now, let me show you why. <clears throat> the prophet, see, when I first read that, I had a problem with that. He said, he that's least in the kingdom. Now, first off, when he said John was the greatest prophet, I had a problem with that. I thought, what measuring stick is he using? I mean, John didn't do any miracles, right? And so I'm reading that, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, that's a pretty big deal. You know, I mean, you got Elijah called down fire. You got Elisha, twice as many miracles. You got all this stuff. And here's John the Baptist, didn't do one miracle, and he's the greatest prophet that ever lived. And I said, okay, God, you're going to have to show me this. I believe it because it's in your word, but you got to explain it because I don't get it. And he said, well, what's a prophet? And see, when God asks you a question, 
he's not looking for information. You ever realize that? He already knows the answer when he asks you the question. So he asked the question, and I said, okay. So I stopped, and I said, okay, I'll look it up. So I looked up prophet. What is a prophet? One with a message from God, or one who speaks for God, right? I said, okay, one with a message for God. And then I started seeing, okay, wait a minute. So God started to show me, <clears throat> if you look at Moses, Moses was a great prophet. But what was, he, what, what was his message? He's coming. Every prophet said, he's coming. Every prophet, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Had nothing to do with miracles, had nothing to do with it. But John the Baptist shows up. He's the first one, got a different message. He's here. That's a greater message. It made him a greater prophet. But John also watched him and said, there goes the Son of God. Isn't that right? So think about that. His message was, he's here. That made him better than the old prophets. But then he says, ah, but there he goes. And then I realized why he said that we are greater than John, because no person born of the Spirit will ever say, there he goes. Why? Because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always. Therefore, because of that, he is with us, and that makes us greater than the greatest prophet, because we got a better message, a greater message. God is always here. He's always present. He's always ready. He is God, and he wants to be like God. Amen? And when I saw that, I realized then what he was trying to get to us, that to understand what it meant for him to be the greatest. And he said, nevertheless, he that's least in the kingdom is greater. So don't think of yourself, but you don't understand, Curry. I live in some over here by myself, out this, and, you know, had never done anything. So what? You can pray and you can say. Yes. And if you can pray and you can say, you can change your city, your state, your nation. You can change the world. And now you have access to the internet. You can not only change it, you can reach it. You can sit in front of your computer and reach the world, yes. preaching the gospel. Amen? Yes. All right. Y'all get anything out of this? Yes. All right. All right. Cue My brother? The Cue the video. Yes, we can do that. Oh, we got it. Okay. We have a video. Everybody's pointing me different directions. Okay. We have a video. These are some of the things we want to show you. These are some of the testimonies. <clears throat> we will bring it up. What are, let me get out of the way. And then we will bring it up. What? Okay, that's my daughter. After she fell out of the window, uh, you can see she was pretty banged up. Both wrists are in bandages, like I said, and they had cast under that. And then her face is all smashed up. Uh, this was her in the hospital. She is now 37, I think it is, has a son. And she has traveled with me probably more than any other one person around the world, and honestly, probably knows this message better than any other person that has traveled with me. Yeah. Um, and whenever I'm gone, somebody calls, she tells them, they say, I need to know what your dad wants to do about this, and she'll say, do this, this, and this. Then when I get back, she says, dad, so-and-so called, and I would say, okay, well, tell them to do this. She goes, that's what I told them, because so, she's got it in her. Amen? Yeah. All right, let's go to the another one, to the another one. That is the J.G. Lim Shield. That tells you. <laughs> ah, and this is from... Um, You'll see a woman on here with crutches sitting down. Her friend had come to me the night before. This was the largest Christian meeting that Poland had ever had. And she came to me the night before and said, my friend came. She's been prayed for by everybody. Nothing's happened. Will it do any good to bring her to you? I said, yeah, they probably got her filled this far up. Would you bring her to me and we'll just top it off, get it done. And so uh, we got to her. You'll see her. She has crutches. Uh, she will come forward on her seat a little bit and you'll see what God does. These are some of the different people we have prayed for. You'll see them throughout. Those are prayer claws and people piled up for me to pray over. That little boy was deaf and they were testing his hearing. We're praying for people over the telephone. They had their loved ones on the telephone that were sick. We prayed for them live over the phone, and people got healed in other countries. It was a mass healing uh, all over the place. The girl that you'll see in a minute with the crutches, her feet were fused. She could not move her feet. She had never walked. All she could do is swing herself to move, and you'll see what God does to her. But she had never walked before. Yeah. 
free. Uwalniamy cię. And whom the Son sets free. A ten, kogo syn wyzwoli, is free indeed. Ten jest naprawdę wolny. So be free. Więc bądź wolny. Do what you could not. That's her friend standing and that's her sitting with the crutches right there. You'll see her in just a minute. She was explaining, uh, reminding me of the situation. You'll see her again in just a moment, the results of this. There she is. First time she ever got to dance. <coughs> I guess the end of that one? Yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> what else we got on there? I'm trying to think of all the different things. Uh, there's four pictures, I think, at the very beginning. If, from the Africa, yes. Let's see, the, there's the first one. This man was delivered to us uh, at the church. Uh, they brought him in. He was turned away from a hospital. He had HIV. They were expecting him to die. That's when they put him out of the hospital. They only have to report HIV deaths if they die in a hospital. Now they are kicking him out of the hospitals to keep their numbers down. So even though you're seeing less numbers, it doesn't mean less people are dying. It just means less are dying in the hospital. And so they brought him in. They asked me to pray for him. As soon as he got there, I didn't see him for a while. But then when they got to him, his mother is standing right over on this side. You can't see her, but he had the blanket over him. There was no sign of life. I wasn't even sure if he was alive, but nobody, no one had pronounced him dead, so I assumed he was alive. I knelt down, was going to pray. I put my hands on him. Instead of praying, I started crying. Then I stood up, and I touched him with my foot and said, in, in the name of Jesus, stand up, take up your bed, and walk. So go to the next one. <clears throat> His mother pulled the blanket off. He turned over. This was the first sign of life that I had seen. Go to the next one. <clears throat> he stands up. I'm still commanding life into his body. And number four, that's him walking off. He walked around. We still had about two or three hours of uh, service going on. This was about a six-hour service. <clears throat> we had uh, about 5,000 people there. And he walked around for two hours. Two hours later, they interviewed him on video, and he had gained 20 kilos of weight. That's about 45 pounds altogether. And had gained back to his normal. Now, that's not an, an anointing or a gift most people want, but for him, it was good. Okay? So, but uh, that was, uh, in that one service, we had over 300 people healed of HIV, confirmed by doctors in one group that we ministered to one by one. I went into the middle of them. They hugged me. They kissed me. They grabbed me. I laid hands on them, and we went through. We went three more weeks around the country, started to leave, got back, and they gave us a report that over 300 people, right at 300 people that were there, had been healed and documented healed of HIV. Amen. So let's go to the next one. Amen. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this was actually in Santee, uh, California, which is right outside of San Diego. And so we went there. This man had never walked. He, he had cerebral palsy and uh, something else, muscular dystrophy. Yes, he had those two things, had never walked. Uh, there was other issues going on. That's his caregiver there in the white uh, sweater. And so they brought him in. We brought him through. I leaned over him, closed my eyes. I don't normally close my eyes. I've learned better. I keep my eyes open when I pray. And so I leaned over him, but I did close my eyes, and I started praying, and I felt movement. So I opened my eyes and leaned back, and he jumped out of the chair, Go to the next picture. That's him running. <clears throat> and you can see him running, and it looks a bit strange. And when he ran, it looked strange because he didn't just run normal. He ran very strangely. 
right, for, for a bit. And he ran completely around the church. And the more he ran, the straighter he got. And so eventually he ran around the church, ran out the front door of the church. We were still having a healing service going on. He ran out the front door and took off down the street. Literally took off. His caregiver had to get in a van and chase him down and load him back up. And then the pastor, we were loading up that night. It was the last night. We're loading up. We're standing out in the parking lot. And the pastor texted uh, one of the, one of my road team that was with me. And all he wrote was, he ran out of the building. And so the next day we're in San Diego recording some things, uh, historical things, and he texted us again. And he said, he ran out of the building. <laughs> and then about two days later, we're in Arizona, and he texted my friend again. And he said, he ran out of the building. <laughs> and he just, that passed, but everybody knew him in that town. I mean, he was well known because they used to walk him down the street in a, uh, in a wheelchair, in the wheelchair he was in. And so everybody knew him. Everybody knew he had never walked. And so this was big news for that entire city. And, uh, but that's what we kept getting. He ran out of the building. <laughs> so, amen. Uh, what's the next one? Oh, this is uh, surgical steel. This was put... Now, the, the thing you see here, this is a music stand. Kind of like that, but it's a music stand. <clears throat> a lady came to our healing service in Grand Junction, Colorado. She didn't tell me any details. Thank God. My faith breaker might have broke, and I might not have had faith for it. <laughs> okay. But she said she had back problems. I put my hand on her back, commanded her back to be healed. Uh, told her to start doing what she couldn't do. She didn't really move very much. I, I, wasn't, I didn't like that, but it was what I could get. And so she started moving, and then she left, and she went home, went to bed. And when she came back in the next morning, she had a box. And when she came in, she poured the box out onto the music stand and said, this is med uh, medical surgical steel doctors put in my back. When I woke up this morning, it was lying in my bed. Now, amen. Now, we, she took it, and there are numbers on these things. When they put it in, they have to have certain numbers to be able to tell what they are and who did it and that kind of stuff. She took it back to her doctor, showed it to him. He said, I don't know how you did this. He said, but that is the metal I put in your back. And he said, and you've had no surgery to take it out. So he said, I don't know. And she tried to explain it to him, and he said, well, it's a miracle. And so that was... Um, <clears throat> That was in Grand Junction. That was the same uh, healing service where a woman came to me that had two baby boys that were dead in her womb, had been dead a while, and they were going to they, they try to take the babies. They said, if we wait, you'll probably spontaneously abort. So that's what they were trying to do. But she came in crying. Well, I told her, put your hands on your belly. She did. I put my hand on her hand. I don't just touch women's belly. And so I put my hand on her hands, commanded life said, you will live and not die in the name of Jesus. She went home, was going home. They told her, if you feel anything going on, it's probably you aborting the babies. Come to the hospital and we'll take care of it. She, on her way home from the healing service, she felt movement, uh, went to the hospital. <clears throat> A couple of hours later, two healthy baby boys were born. Amen. Um, so that was the same service. Uh, now, the amazing thing is there was a... Um, woman that was deaf and a deacon that was deaf in one ear. The woman got healed and the deacon got healed that was standing there holding her. Uh, I cast a deaf spirit out of her. She got healed and the deaf spirit in the deacon left too, right, at the same time. And there's a whole joke about that, but it's, it's true. And so that all happened in one meeting. Now, here's the thing. The amazing miracles happened in this meeting. The person that was with me that traveled with me People call me in to teach on healing or whatever they ask me to teach on, right? I go in, I teach on that. I try to stay on that as much as I can. A friend that was with me, traveling with me, his thing was the rapture. That was his thing, right? That's all you ever want to talk about. Well, that and UFOs and JFK and stuff. Anyway, so <laughs> just being honest. But anyway, he used to talk about these things. And he got into a disagreement with the pastor's son, who was also the associate pastor, over end time stuff. I wasn't there teaching on end times, but they got into an argument. These, all these miracles happened, and I never got invited back. Why? Because of the argument my friend had over end times. That kept, even, even in the face of these amazing miracles, it shows, and that's why you, there's things I don't get involved in. Why? Because it just cuts things off. It just cuts, it divides. 
And, and if you ask me to teach on this, I'm going to try to stay on that and teach on that as much as I can and not just try to cause problems. But it's amazing how even that kind of thing will cause somebody to just disconnect, even though God was obviously doing some amazing things. All right? Uh, we got more. I'll show you more later. We'll, we'll, we'll show you some more tomorrow. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? No, we'll, we'll do it later. Yeah, we'll do that later. Tomorrow, we'll, maybe, or something. Yeah, yeah, we'll just show the rest of them later. Yes, sir. <clears throat> right. Usually, okay, first off, most people in the medical field are trying to fulfill a spiritual calling through natural means. You called a healing, didn't know you pr could probably do it in the beginning, went through the medical field. Not saying you should stop the medical field, you have access to a lot of sick people, okay? At the same time, any compassion we have, <clears throat> especially, okay, when I was talking about human compassion before, most of that is for loved ones very close to you. That's the one that usually can cause problem. The fact that you have compassion for sick people is from God. That's God's love in you for them. It, 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 it can be human, but only because God was there in the first place. And he's trying to draw that out into you. So there is a compassion that he will woo you with because he knows your heart. Now, the fact that you're a Christian and that you're in the medical field, it would be natural that he would draw you and give you compassion because he wants you to be more effective in what you're doing. I'm not saying you should quit doing that. We do have, uh, we've had a couple of doctors now that were uh, our doctors, and they actually shut down their clinics and started ministering to people uh, in a healing room. And so we've seen that kind of thing because they were more effective that way. But I also told them, don't give up your medical license. Why? Because that gives you access to records that gives you access to things that we might need to call on at some point. So, but it's not, <clears throat> it's not a human, that part is not the human emotion. The human emotion that I was talking about is when you are close to someone and you want them healed because you love them because you know them. When you love somebody and you don't even know them, that's not human. That, that's a divine love and that is God moving in that direction. Now, a person can have that and not even be connected to God because of the, the, the spark of God in their life that even just keeps them breathing. Right? So, the, but the main thing is, if you move on that, you'll never go wrong. Why? Because it is still compassion, and you're still trying to help, and it's always right to do the right thing. Amen? Amen. 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 Go ahead, sir. 